artificial intelligence is no longer utopia. It's part of our daily lives. We are living, shopping, and even conversing with AI. More importantly, scientists are using AI to save lives and protect the planet. Hello, and welcome to the Center of International Development, Friday Speaker Series. My name is Emile Giovanni Zuno. I am a student at the Graduate School of Education, studying education and technology. In a previous life, I was a computer scientist. Um, and I am a student ambassador at the Center of International Development. I look forward to the discussions of today on AI for social impact, result from deployment for public health and conservation. The format for this section is a 20, 25 minute presentation and around 20 minutes for Q&A. Before we get started, a few housekeeping rules. One, given that this is a hybrid event, we'll be asking questions from both in-person and virtual audience. I will be walking around with the mic for in-person questions. And uh, my fellow CID student ambassador will ask questions from the virtual audience. We are also recording today's session, as you may have heard, but we'll keep the camera on the speaker, only ensuring that only voice from the audience will be recorded. The video of this event will be available on CID YouTube channel. But without further ado, I would like to briefly introduce our speaker for today, Milin Tambe. He is a Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science and Director of Center for Research in Computation and Society at Harvard University. Currently, he is also the Principal Scientist and Director for AI for Social Goods at Google Research. Professor Tembe's work focused on AI and multi, on advancing AI and multi-agent system for public health, conservation, and public safety. With a track record of building pioneering AI system for social impact. He is a recipient of the IGCAI John McCarthy Awards, AAMAS ACM Autonomous Agent Research Awards, Triple AI Robert S. Engelmore Memorial Lecture Award, and he is a fellow of Triple AI and ACM. He is also the recipient of the Informs Wagner Prize for Excellence in Operation Research Practice and Risk Prize for MRA for the Military Operation Research Society. For his work on AI and public safety, he has received Columbus Fellowship Foundation Homeland Security Awards and Commendation and Certificate of Appreciation for the U from the U.S. Coast Guards, the Federal Air Marshal Service, and Airport Police at the City of Los Angeles. Thank you all for being here, and Milin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, being here. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, AI for social impact. Earlier, I thought the talk was uh, one hour, so I had given a longer title. Um, so I'll focus more on maternal and child care. If there's time that remains, then we will go into other topics as well. So for the past 15 years, my team and I have focused on advancing AI for social impact, focusing on topics of public health, conservation, and public safety. Key challenge is how to optimize our limited intervention resources. So I want to point out that achieving social impact and AI innovation goes, in ha goes hand in hand. It does. AI for social impact doesn't mean taking known AI techniques and just applying them as they are. So we need AI innovation. So with respect to public health, we have large populations to serve limited number of public health resources. Concrete example is work we've done with youth experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. Harnessing the social networks of these youth, we are able to show that our AI algorithms are far more effective in reducing HIV risk behaviors compared to traditional approaches. But this work required innovation in the area of social network algorithms. With respect to conservation, we have large conservation areas to protect limited number of ranger resources. Concrete example is work we've done in Uganda and Cambodia. We're harnessing past poaching data. We are able to predict where poachers set traps or snares. And for the past several years, have been able to remove thousands, if not tens of thousands of these snares. But this work required innovation in the area of what we call green security games, which combines machine learning and game theory. 
With respect to public safety and security, we've contributed a new model called Stackelberg Security Games and contributed new algorithms that have been in use by security agencies in the United States. Which flight should air marshals be on? That's our software that's been deciding that, or you know, how to patrol ports of Boston and Los Angeles and New York. That's uh, again, a Stackelberg Security Games software that the Coast Guard have used. These may seem like very different applications, but they're all tied together by underlying multi-agent systems research. Today's talk, I'll primarily focus on this problem of AI for maternal and child care. And if time remains, I'll talk about the other, another project in HIV prevention. So the motivation here is the UN sustainable development target that by 2030, maternal mortality ratio, mothers dying during childbirth or soon after should be below 70 per 100,000 live births. So that's the UN target. Where we are today is uh, Western Europe, uh, very low. United States is higher but and growing. The maternal mortality ratio in developing countries is coming down. But for example, in India is still higher than 100. And that's where we start today. Uh, the, manifestation of this is that a woman dies in childbirth every 20 minutes, four out of 10 children are too thin or short in India. So we are very, we're very fortunate to be working with a nonprofit called Arman, which works with 26 million beneficiaries of mothers in India, is active in 19 states in India, and very inspired by the founder of Arman, who in her uh, talk, which is on her website, you can see she says, pregnancy is not a disease, Childhood is not an ailment. Dying due to a natural life event is not acceptable. So I met with uh, Dr. Hegde in 2019 and agreed that we should collaborate, we should do something. Well, what can we do with AI? So here's the one, the first problem we've settled on. They have a mobile health program called Mmitra. The basic idea here is because there is such a proliferation of uh, cell phones that Mmitra essentially delivers a voice message in the local language every week once a mother registers when the mother is expecting all the way to the baby being one year old there's one message a week in the local language something like you are three months into your pregnancy you should use a, this health supplement or your baby is three weeks old get them vaccinated and these messages go out to new and expecting mothers with the expectation that they'll keep listening to these messages. And they've shown in randomized control trials that mothers who listen to these messages over time benefit significantly for the health, their own health and the health of the babies. And in fact, 2 million mothers have enrolled in this program so far. So where do we come in? Unfortunately, 30 to 40% of mothers who enroll eventually become low listeners or drop out of the program. To understand why we've ourselves been fortunate to be uh, taken by Arman to the sites where we visit, uh, where they work, to the hospitals where they work, to the localities where these uh, beneficiaries live. Now, I've grown up in Mumbai, so I know these localities, but going inside the homes of these beneficiaries, these are mothers, these are families that are way, way below the international poverty line was eye opening and revealing as to why mothers may drop out. There's just too many pressures. So what can we do about it? Arman has this uh, call center from where they can give service calls to mothers to try to encourage them to stay in the program, to adhere, in the, to, adhere to the messages, to keep listening to these messages. But the call center cannot call all of the mothers to motivate them. The question is which mother should they call? So you can imagine that there's a large number of beneficiaries, 100,000, and you can call 1,000 per week. Which 1,000 should we call in a service call per week so that they keep listening to these automated voice messages. We are trying to maximize the total number of health messages that these mothers have listened to. So we have this uh, health worker, there's automated voice messages that are going out and she's trying to decide live calls, personal calls to try to motivate these mothers to continue to listen to these automated messages. Now in this case, the four mothers shown in red, just for example here, I'm showing you five mothers, Four who are shown in red have not listened to an automated voice message last week. This one in green has listened. And the health worker has to decide who should I call if she can only call two mothers this week. So if she calls the first two, this turns out to be a good choice. They turn to green. They started listening to voice messages that are coming in. This 
third mother automatically changed her state from not listening to listening, even though there was no service call. Now there's two other mothers who are still in red. So the health worker has to decide this week now, given this state, who should I call? And if she says, okay, I'm gonna call these two mothers, this turns out to be a bad choice because these two in red don't change their state. And in fact, those who were green also changed to red. So the point here is that a service call may not change a beneficiary state, may not persuade them to start listening to automated voice messages. A beneficiary may on their own start listening to messages. And yet you have to prioritize a thousand beneficiaries out of the hundred thousand per week. So we model this problem in what we call a restless bandit. I'm gonna give you an inside look at how this restless bandit model works. So some of you may be familiar. I heard, uh, you know, you are a former computer scientist, you said, so maybe you know some of these models, but essentially each arm is a Markov decision problem. Essentially, a mother can be in a bad state. She has not listened to an automated voice message or a good state. She has listened to an automated voice message. We have actions. We can give her a service call, which is intervention or no service call, no intervention. And then we have a model of the mother's behavior. If she's in a bad state, has not listened to an automated voice message, and we don't give a service call, there's a 0.2 chance she'll automatically transition to a good state. Point two. But if we give her a service call, the chance of going from bad state to good state increases from 0.2 to 0.8. Now, in reality, of course, we have 100,000 mothers. So that means that we have 100,000 such models uh, for each mother. So each, each of this is a markup decision problem. So we have 100,000 of these arms of the bandit. And we have to pull, that means call, 1,000 of these. So 100,000 choose 1,000, you can see this is a very big number, so it's not easy to figure out which mothers to call. So there is a approach that is well known in the literature, it's called the Whittle Index approach. The basic idea of a Whittle Index is to compute the, we are trying to compute this Whittle Index of each arm, and that gives us a ranking of all of the arms, and then we can pull the top 1,000. What a Whittle Index does is it computes the benefit of a service call on a mother given her behavior model. Technically, it's uh, defined as the infimum subsidy that can be given to a passive action such that its Q value becomes equal to the Q value of intervention. If you aren't into this, it's fine. The main point is that we have ranked all of the arms and now we can pull the top 1000. There's not an out of the box algorithm that can compute this Whittle index. Fortunately, we had did defined an earlier algorithm in 2016 that we are using now to compute these Whittle indexes quickly. We also need to prove some technical properties to ensure that we have asymptotic optimality, which we did. So with this, now we are getting ready to use this algorithm. There is, however, one big problem. Previous literature assumes that the transition probabilities, the behaviors of the mother are already given to us. In reality, we don't know. These are new mothers coming into the program. We don't know their behaviors. So what can we do? We have limited beneficiary data, previous mothers who have enrolled in the program. For each mother, we have their age, income, education level, and other features, and their engagement behavior. They were in a passive state, got a service call, remained in the passive state, or passive state, uh, I mean, not engaging state, got a service call, changed to engaging state. So based on this past traces of behaviors and their features, we can build some kind of a machine learning model. So in the training step, we are going to take all of this data and cluster it such that we can learn a map from mother's features, age, income, education level into a particular cluster, which gives us her behavior, the transition probability. So when a new mother walks in with an, you know, other features, age, income, education level, given this new unseen mother, given her features, we can predict which cluster she would belong to. From there, we can predict what her behaviors would be, her transition probabilities. And from there, we can compute the Whittle indexes, which allow us to choose the top K mothers to call. So we did all this, and there's some benefits to clustering in terms of computational benefits, and also um, allows us to compensate for lack of data. 
So following all this, we ran a large scale field study here. First large scale application of these rest based bandits in the field, certainly for public health. So we took a study of 23,000 beneficiaries, 7,667 were in the restless bandit group, 7,667 were in a round robin group, and 7,667 is current standard of care. That is no intervention calls going out. So in, the, in each group, there were 225 arms pulled, that is to say 225 calls given. In the restless bandit group, the 225 are chosen according to this Whittle index. In the round robin group, we call the first 225, then the next 225, then the next 225. And in the current standard of care, there are no calls going out. And now we want to know how many more health messages were listened to over the current standard of care in each of our different groups. And here's what we find. Along the x-axis here are different weeks. So up to seven weeks along the y-axis are how many more health messages are listened to by these mothers in each of the groups. We find that uh, the rest, restless bandit group, which is shown in blue, 600 more messages are listened to at the end of seven weeks. The round robin group, we can see that there's hardly any gain out of the, from the current standard of care. So, if you look at from statistical significance, we achieve statistical significance of the restless bandit versus current standard of care, but no statistical significance of round robin over current standard of care. So what do we learn from here? It's important to optimize these service calls. If you just call these mothers in a round robin fashion, it doesn't lead to any improvement in terms of listening to more messages. And the restless bandit group cuts by 30% the drop off rate over the current standard of care. So that means that we've got 30% more mothers remaining listening to this program. So having done this, we built a system. It's called the Saheli that is now deployed with the Arman nonprofit. Saheli also means a friend in Hindi. This is also an acronym. So you can see that we work incredibly hard to come up with a good acronym here. 100,000 of these beneficiaries have so far been assisted by this software. And it continue, this continues to assist more mothers. Uh, there's a YouTube video if you wanted to see AI for social good in partnership with Arman, made by a very talented team. And in it, uh, Dr. Hegde points out, because of the system we have built, that we are able to reach out to more and more women each week and get them back into the fold and save lives because of AI. There's also interviews with beneficiaries. And I wanted to show you one. If uh, the video plays, we'll watch it. <laughs> And also this uh, being in Mumbai and spoken in Marathi, which is also my mother tongue, is particularly satisfying that this is happening. So we looked at a survey of 500 of these beneficiaries to understand why the service call helped them change their mind. So out of those 500 that we surveyed, 60% said the service call actually helped them listen, uh, improve their listenership. 40% said the service call didn't help. Of the 60% who said the service call helped, we asked them why. And they said seven, more than 70% that they got more information about the Mitra mobile health program. That is to say, they got more motivation to continue listening. There are also some uh, potential simple alternatives we could try. For example, instead of this whole complex Whittle index algorithm, maybe there's a greedy, a simpler algorithm we could try. And we did this in simulation, given that we have all this data from the real trial, we can construct a simulation and then see if we had tried a simpler algorithm with the restless bandits, what would it have done? And what we find here is that uh, the Whittle index algorithm in simulation here would have led to more listening the greedy algorithm, not as much. So it is useful to have this Whittle index algorithm. There are many other interesting research advances to be made here in terms of AI. So this is looking towards computer science and saying that the doing work in terms of social impact leads to newer research challenges. One of them is uh, this decision-focused learning. 
So we have this data to deployment pipeline. We start with data from the NGO. This is all done in partnership. Then we, as we, as I discussed, there is this machine learning to learn a mapping from features to behaviors, transition probability. And we want to do as good a job here of figuring out these behaviors. Then we have we pick the top K and we want to do a as good a job here of picking the top K mothers. And then we of course deploy. So we have two stages. First, we maximize learning accuracy, and then we optimize. So this is a two separate stages. Uh, the optimization is to maximize decision quality to get more mothers to listen to health messages. However, maximizing learning accuracy doesn't translate into maximizing decision quality. So if you have applications where you're trying to do optimization and you just focus on maximizing uh, machine learning accuracy, that may actually not lead to better decision quality. And so here's a real example. So we have two data sets. In one data set shown in orange, there is a higher predictive accuracy, better prediction of mother's behaviors. The blue actually has a lower accuracy. We can't predict the mother's behavior as accurately. When we do service calls based on these two different data sets and see who listened to more messages, what we find is that data set one, actually there's a less change in mother's behavior. And data set two, more mothers listen. So why might this happen? So this is a very simple illustration of that. On the x-axis are features, on the y-axis are transition probabilities. So this is a very simple illustrative example. Blue are low risk mothers, red are high risk mothers. And now if you imagine we want to maximize learning accuracy, the blue dots are more in number, low risk mothers are lower in, more in number. So we maximize learning accuracy with the linear regressor to the left of that orange line are blue dots and to the right are these red dots. And blue, this linear regressor learns this green line to make predictions. And so it's high learning accuracy, but it misses these high risk mothers, which means low decision quality. A decision focused learning approach, we've maximized the loss function directly, allows us to say that we really want to capture these high risk mothers. So this leads to this green regressor line, which you can see is poor in terms of learning accuracy but actually captures what we really want to capture, which is a better decision quality. So we've deployed this decision-focused learning in the Arman engine, with the Arman software now. And what we find indeed is that when we do real world experiments, that when we do, this was done with 9,000 mothers. Again, uh, you can see in terms of predictive accuracy, a two-stage approach, which does first improve machine learning accuracy, then improve decision quality, leads to higher accuracy, but in terms of actual deployment performance, how many more health messages were engaged with. The decision-focused learning leads to higher decision quality, higher more, more messages being listened to, even though it has a lower predictive accuracy. There are many other interesting uh, challenges. So for example, if we look at the fact that we can't make these accurate predictions about the transitions of these mothers, but we can instead just give intervals. So we can say that um, each mother, we can't say exactly what is the transition probability, but it's between 0.4 and 0.7, or between 0.2 and 0.4. Solving these problems with this uncertainty becomes difficult. We solve, we've uh, come up with this newer algorithm, which minimizes maximum regret to try to address this. There are other applications also of this restless bandit approach. One of them is tuberculosis prevention, which uh, as you may know, in India alone is responsible for half a million deaths per year, 3 million people are infected. And a patient has to take their medicine for six months. I get tired if I'm asked to take something for seven days, I'll drop off. Six months is a very long time. And because of side effects, patients drop out of the program. So again, there's a health worker who's tasked with trying to remind these TB patients to continue to take your medicine. So now again, this health worker is faced with this challenge, can't call all of the patients under her care. Which patients should she call? Very similar to the maternal and child care problem. So in this case, supposing she calls the first three, realizes that these two had taken their medicine last night, this one had not. And so 
it's after the call that she realizes who's taken their medicine, who's not. Now she has to decide tomorrow who to call again. And so she may call some other patients and day after day has to make that decision of which patients to call. This problem is similar to the maternal and child care problem I showed, except that the state of the patient is not known before the call. This problem can be solved by what's called a partially observable markup decision problem. So we've defined solutions for these problems as well. But in terms of going next in 2023 and beyond, our goal with Arman is to reach 1 million beneficiaries. We've reached 100,000. To get there, we hope 2023 would be possible. We are also working with the government of India. So this is something where Kilkari is a government of India program that's 10 times larger or more it's all India program. The 5.28 crore is 52 million messages being sent. So it's a massive, massive program, but faces similar challenges of drop off. And again, for maternal and child care. And that's something that we've begun to engage with. Other works include uh, work with a nonprofit called Pushy Baby for malnutrition, um, predicting where malnutrition exists. We've also done some work with uh, Nonprofit called Help Mom in Nigeria. There's a paper we've got in this Ichikai 22 conference. This is more in simulation right now, but hopefully can be taken to practice for improving vaccination rates. So uh, I can stop here. Uh, I have another section I can go through, but I can also stop here.